you know, when you have something in your soul, then you produ- you can produce anything. You just have to find, you just have to have the window of opportunity to to produce it. So uh, when I knew that I could juice anything, I I could, there were times where I would go by the smell of a, of a fruit or a vegetable, or I could go by the feel of it and develop, uh, develop a, a recipe. It's more than juice uh, because Whenever you, whenever you develop uh, a product, you develop it with two thoughts in mind. And one thought uh, is to change your condition, and the next thought is to change other people's condition. The connection that I, I like to have with my customers is the fact that uh, I don't want them. I don't want anyone to walk into my house and feel disconnected. We have to have a collaborative feeling. Uh, the demographic in this area is uh, 96% African American. Uh, the majority of people that come here are uh, primarily everybody. <laughs> so you'll get uh, maybe 30% African American, you know, 20% white. Uh, and 50% kind of across the board, um, kind of mixed up. But, you know, most days you'll find, you know, your African-American people, your white people, your uh, you get, uh, my Latino brothers and sisters, you'll have uh, uh, your Asian community. So they, all, they all kind of stop in. Yeah. Uh, but it, it doesn't cater. We don't cater to just the, the average per, average person. Uh, we, cater, we cater not the average person around here. We cater to everyone. That's why it's more than juice because we want to establish uh, lines of communication across uh, across all borders. So we're changing the we're changing the, the face of juice by using the mission uh, the mission of, of of social impact related around uh, uh, economic um, product and hopefully changing the way the uh, community looks at business in, in, this, in this area. Majority of the times when you have a business, they just plop down, open up, and then they don't reach out to other people. And uh, what, what our goal is to reverse that we want to reach to the, reach the people first and then open up the business and then uh, bridge that any other gaps that we have. The America is run by small businesses and large business uh, is just just what it is, just large business. And you can get lost in that washing machine. But our small businesses uh, develop and help develop the fabric of of America and what you and, and what you see it today, and uh, to have a small business in Milwaukee is just you know just a, a, a it's a notch upwards. It's a notch going against the grain. You know we're we're in Milwaukee. We were used to large corporations like GMC, um, AMC, uh, General Motors, whatever Harley, you name it, right? But we had this in Milwaukee in the past. We had this this mom and pop feel. Like you can go, you can walk down the street, go to the corner store, and have uh, and have have a conversation with the owner. And now um, that's coming back. It left a while for a while, but now it's, it's it's coming back. So now you get to see, you know, who who makes your shirt or um, who makes your pants. Our community is called Lindsay Heights. It is developed uh, and was developed a very, very long time ago, but didn't have a real major name. Um, it is also in small part called Walnut Way. And Walnut Way is a 
nonprofit uh, built around 20 years ago that uh, Larry, and, Larry and Sharon Adams uh, dreamt about and developed it out of their out of their vision for a uh, prosperous community. Um, Larry was a uh, was a farmer, but he was also kind of a uh, ex marine, or not really ex marine, he was marine uh, out of Nam. But then also Sharon was director of the Greater Girl Scouts of uh, New York, and um, and she came to Milwaukee to uh, to look after her her people. And in the, in that light, she found a, a neighborhood that that lost its assets. The neighborhood lost its lost its assets. Or the assets were dormant. And what we had to do is we had to provide water. Somebody had to water these seeds in order for the assets to grow. And so that's what they did. They rewatered the, the soil and the people started to grow. And now you have, uh, now you have, you know, we have peach, pe a peach orchard in the back. We have a compost pile that's like as high as this building. We have uh, uh, four production gardens um, back here. We got beehives. We have pear trees, peach trees, cherry trees. That's who we, that's who we, that's who we partner with. We partner with uh, Walnut Way and we try to piggyback off of their, um, their communication with the, with, the, with the community. You're sitting in the Innovation of Wellness Commons and it was developed and Walnut Way and also were developed from residents in this community. It's very rare to have successful organizations from developed out of the visions of the residents in this community. It's very, very rare. And I can't say that enough. So uh, Innovation Wellness Commons houses outposts, us, the Juice Kitchen, um, Findy Food Market and Milwaukee Center for Independence who provides 4,000 meals per day for children across the, across, the, across the city. And that's what we do. Um, we, we partner with people who want to do good. I, I just want the Juice Kitchen to be a, a, a for, forum for people to uh, have, a, have a conversation. Um, around whatever is going on. Uh, we're, we're a peaceful environment who helps to serve, hope, hopes to serve humanity in its purest light and uh, try to stave off the, the earthquake of Pompeii <laughs> and the volcanic ash uh, so we won't get buried. So we want to provide an umbrella for those people who who are not sheltered. Well, I started at Maya, and I was interested in drawing and design, and that quickly shifted the day I walked into the sculpture department. By the time I was a sophomore, I knew I was going to be a sculpture major. The whole three-dimensionality of it, and the tactile, and the body involvement. You know, um, I never was very good at drawing, um, or illustration, or uh, concept, concepting in so I think sculpture just came kind of naturally to me. I worked for a bronze foundry called Heart Bronze. And when I graduated from Mayan, our professor, Joe Menla, he ran the sculpture department. His dream was to start an art foundry. So he left the teaching profession. He started an art foundry. I was in Europe at the time carving stone. And I came back, and my intent was to sell the work that I made, return to Europe. And so my business model was sort of naively thinking that I'd sell this work in Milwaukee and return to Europe and continue to carve. And I would be in both places. Well, that didn't happen. I wasn't able to sell the work. I um, got a job at the foundry that Joe was running, and I worked there until they closed, it was like seven years later. We had clients that needed to continue to have their work cast. So um, we started the foundry in our basements by basically all the people that worked there took a different part of the craft and did it part-time and we managed to cast our clients work until um, one day we decided to all come together, rent a space and all be in the same place and then one thing led to the next. The next thing we were doing was buying a building and um, 
because we had that collective um, group, we were able to finance the building, we were able to finance the business and you know, move forward. But it was really by the seat of our pants. We didn't know the first thing about business. So then within Milwaukee's artist communities, what is specifically your and Vanguard's involvement? So we mostly work with artists that have either a backer or a commission or um, maybe they're starting out and they have a small project. We sometimes will um, let artists come in if they're new to the process and their students are just out of school or they want to learn. We oftentimes accommodate people um, in the learning process. We also work with and teach people how to bring in their object so that we can work with it and give them a successful bronze. So we spend a lot of time sort of nurturing um, knowledge and um, more and more we're getting students where they think that they don't need to make anything, they just need to bring an idea. So we try to work with their idea and involve them in the decision making as much as possible so that the work is belongs that they own the work and we aren't making the decisions for them, we are just their hands. So, and then we also do things in the community at large, you know, where there might be a sculpture that needs to be restored or something in the community that needs to be attended to and we'll often advise for free. We work with the historic monuments that are in the parks. We try to educate people about how to keep them maintained. Um, we try to preserve the his, historic um, character and value when we get commissioned to do it. Um, so I would say that's a, a really big way that we affect um, what you see. Our goals here at Vanguard are always to kind of up our um, services so that we can reach a broader artist base. We can only hope that there'll be sort of a renewed interest in the crafts because that's what kind of where we lie. That's our niche. We are a service to the community. Oh, well, actually, I think every shelter's goal is to not have to have any animals to take in, but that's not going to happen. But it's more or less making people aware. And when you take an animal into your home, it's part of your family. There's a lot of irresponsible people that just let them out or get rid of them, so to speak. Well, we didn't always have a physical location. We had foster homes, and that's when I used to go to homes and interview people and adopt that way. And then we started showing at various places like Pet Supplies Plus and Petco and PetSmart, and decided the best way to get more people to adopt was to open up a physical location, which has been very successful. Uh, stray cats found outside, been feeding all summer, don't want moving. My favorite is boyfriend allergic. But, you know, what I've learned over the years is that if people have decided to not keep a pet, they're not going to keep it. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather take it in here or any no kill facility than go to somewhere where they might be euthanized. Mm -hmm. So, and try to rehome them. And even some of the feral cats, if we work with them, we're on. Well, I'm not sure people are aware that we're here. Um, we advertise. We have a face on Facebook, we have a website. So we take part in the things that are going around in West Allen. So people certainly know who they are. I'm very careful about where they go. I check with the vets to make sure that any pets they have or have had have been taken care of, got medical treatment when they need it. Um, you pretty get get a good feel for people and when you're talking to them. Um, there are people that I turn down. Especially if they've gotten rid of an animal and dropped it off, which is humane society, which is where I want to adopt it. And I have a policy that is in our contract that if you adopt it, it doesn't work out whenever that you bring the cat back. I've had a cat brought back for 12 years because somebody died. So I rehomed it. So. But I try to keep communication open, give my cell phone number. Any questions, just call. Call anybody here, stop in if you have any issues. Or, so. And always be available to give people a call you. So, there's not enough space to take in all the cats, and of course, not enough money. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's a, just 
just the basic cost of running the shelter plus all of that bills. Mm -hmm. I may have some, I have some cats that really don't cost me anything. People don't vote, but then I'll get an illness and it's a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, there's no profit. <laughs> but we have a lot of good people that donate food, and yeah. butter, and supplies. Mm -hmm. That really helps all of us. I think it's a good thing. People are very complimentary. They think what we're doing is a great thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people aren't even aware that there is such a need. Mm -hmm. So it's all about educating that there really is. In, in every community. And if you see a stray animal out there with a dog or cat, don't just feed them. Do something. I think all animals, but even cats that have been living outside, have potential. And I've proven that time and time again. Uh, they just have to be given a chance.